darkness. We up. Welcome to the State of the State of Hockey podcast, featuring Justin Jelnick and Joe Hayford. Let's talk hockey. Welcome to the State of the State of Hockey podcast. This is episode 18 edition for Tuesday, September 15th, 2015. I am Justin Jelnick from the State of the State of Hockey blog, along with my partner, Mr. Joe Hayford, also State of the State of Hockey. Joe, how are you? I am superb. Good. Um, It sounds like you got up to some fun Sunday night, based on your tweets and whatnot. Absolutely. Uh, JMS Hockey finally decided to book some ice here in Hopkins, and uh, I took Full advantage of it. We played uh, an hour and a half game, and it was fantastic. Yeah, I uh, I guess uh, personally, I kind of uh, unofficially hung up my skates about two years ago. I was involved with Hockey Finder, uh, their leagues in Edina, right before we moved to Apple Valley, and uh, it, it, it's just it's just harder for me, I guess, uh, to to be motivated to go out at nine. But uh, I'm I'm glad you don't feel the same way. <laughs> uh, there's there's checks and balances, I guess. If I were uh... I might feel differently halfway through the winter time, but uh, right now uh, I miss hockey so much that I'm, I'm just I'm on to do whatever I can to get the ice time. I mean, I get about four hours a weekend in. I, I coach my kids' m- mini mites team, and then uh, Sunday nights we play at the Pav. I, I will say I will say one thing. Um, when when I was doing summer league, there was nothing like walking into an ice rink out of ninety degree humidity. Oh yeah, absolutely. That, that is one of the the best feelings. That was the one trick about last night is uh, I haven't skated since Hopkins Pavilion closed down their ice last February. Oh, I didn't realize. Oh, oh yeah, they just closed in the summer, but yeah. So uh, I was a little rusty to start out last night, but uh, I got back in the groove. Good deal. And that's a nice building too. I've I've, I've played there a couple times, and, and St. Louis Park Rec Center is great too. But I, I don't think. James yeah, the, unfortunately, that. the St. Louis Rec Center is like for upper level players, and yeah. As a for, former goalie, I I don't quite have the skating skills that those uh, <laughs> those level yeah. level upper level level four level five guys have. So yeah. I like to stick with the the lower level people. Yeah, part part of me misses playing, but it got hard on my knees by the end, and I just you know didn't like going out that late anymore. <laughs> Yeah, I will tell you, man, my abs are killing me today. <laughs> oh man, poor Joe. But but you're a trooper, you 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 made it to the uh State of the State Hockey Podcast, this uh, first show in three weeks. As we're trying to get through this summer of October to ever get it here. Yes. We're it's month. driving me absolutely insane. We're a month away, so um I came up with uh, tonight's show topic. Uh this was what if you were commissioner for a day? I think uh, since we do have one of the uh, hockey has one of the more maligned commissioners among the press among the uh, major sports in in, in America, uh, I think it's time for uh, you know common guys like you and me to, to to have a say. Yeah, I mean, this is all well and fun, but I I do got to put my two cents in here. I think Gary Bettman is a pretty decent commissioner of the four sports. I definitely think he's the best. I think he's moving up the ranks. I'll give you that. Um, I mean, obviously there's room for improvement no matter what, and everyone's going to have their opinions, but I will say this, one of the things that makes the NHL great is, uh, we do have the best of the four commissioners anyway. I'm not sure I would, uh, agree with that, but, uh, especially given that he's presided over three work stoppages, one that cost a season. Yeah, but he's learned from every one. Yeah, I, I hope so. We'll, we'll know in about four years, won't we? Yeah, I suppose we will. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, especially seeing the dive NFL, NFL has taken. Yeah, well, Goodell is definitely the worst, I think. Uh, I, I I wouldn't be able to fight with you there, but I think so. some other sports I can still make a decent argument. Silver's better. I'm not even sure who's running Major League Baseball anymore. I'm so off the baseball radar. Uh, some new guy. Yeah. Bud Sealy retired. Yeah. Crazy Milwaukee guy. So... But yeah, yes. he was he was the worst. So, so I guess we'll start with you, Joe. If you were commissioner for a day, what would you change? Uh, I guess my first thing would be guaranteed contracts. I mean, as a union guy myself, I, I appreciate what they're there for. Um, but when you're making that much money, I'm 
pretty sure that uh, making, you know, $7 million for just one year instead of seven isn't going to break the bank. And if it does, you have a serious lifestyle issue. <laughs> yeah. um, Thankfully, those issues don't seem to plague NHL players as often as in other sports. Well, no, what was that Blue Jackets player, though, that got taken advantage of by his parents? Yeah, that, that that's true. I, I do remember, vaguely remember that story. Yeah, that, that was pretty uh, disheartening. He's not doing very well financially because of that, but uh, it looks like he's got some friends and and people in the NHL that are helping him out. And that's that's good. Again, so, that NHL so, family so, and mentality. So your 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 uh, assertion here is that uh, perhaps the general managers ought to have more ways out of a long term deal. Uh, yeah, and, you know, as a commissioner, the first thing you want to do is make the people who pay your, your bills and pay for those contracts happy. And uh, having players with guaranteed contracts, uh, you know, circa Nick Backstrom, mm-hmm. uh, it, it can hurt. Yeah. Um, it can hurt fan fan morale. I kind of see what you're saying here. I, I, I do want to point out that one of the biggest criticisms of how the NFL compensates players is that there is almost no guaranteed money unless you're in the very top echelon. Uh, yeah. So. Well, there's there. I mean, unless you get a signing bonus or or something of that sort. I mean, Matt Castle just got a signing bonus and got cut. So yeah, there's guaranteed money right there. Oh, yeah. um, I'm not saying it, there's none, but I'm saying that unless the, uh, it's explicitly spelled out as guaranteed, there's nothing guaranteed. You ha- you have to trust capitalism. Um, you have to negotiate better. I mean, there there's there's things you can do to uh, secure your financial future. When you sign a contract with a with a an organization, there are signing bonuses available, mm-hmm. and uh, I think you should take advantage of that. Oh, I would uh, I would agree. I think that uh, I'm fairly happy with the fact there is a buyout device. I I think I wouldn't mind seeing it expanded a little more, but I'm not so willing to forgive GMs for signing bad deals. I think they I I think giving them too much blanket to end a contract at will isn't. I'm not saying you should end it at will. Okay. Um, I'm saying that guaranteed, fully guaranteed contracts are an issue. So, um, so. I'm more of a fan, and this is the union in me. The buyout number should be 50% of the remaining contract. Mm-hmm. And there should be no cap penalty for the team. Hmm. No cap penalty for buyout contracts. That would really. I'm just processing how how this would uh, very much dramatically change how the league operates. I don't know how you get this past the union either, <laughs> Commissioner Joe. Uh, I mean, that, not, that's I'm, how you get it past them. I mean, I guess I guess you can offer to raise the cap to a ridiculous amount <laughs> in exchange, or well, not, yeah, I mean, not the, even the ridiculous. Cap, but the cap should go up. The cap should go up to ninety mil. Yeah. Yeah, that, that that might be a trade they go for. So what's interesting about being commissioner for the day is that you still have to consider who you have to negotiate with to get these things done. I mean, yeah, I guess... it's it's definitely a, a give and take, but that would be first on my priority list. Um, so, so so maybe not so from much a, from a fan's perspective. It's it's a little disconcerting seeing players that uh and and i get why the rules are in place to protect players from being bought out while they're hurt but i, I kind of get that the nick backstrom situation is a sore spot because it feels like he's on some level deceived the team oh and that's not even that's not my sore spot and that's not the source of this okay this argument um you know there's there's plenty you know heatley was one that we we could have gotten rid of two years ago mm-hmm. um Vanek is another one. We could get rid of him right now. So so maybe not so much ending guarantee contracts, but maybe changing the way buyouts are done so they're a little more available. Correct, yes. Okay. Well, that, you know, I mean, I definitely see how, you know, the examples you give could help the well immediately. 
I'm kind of hoping Vanek bounces back next year, though. Well, and not just help the Wild immediately. I'm talking about in general. Right. From a fan's perspective, it, you, you don't want to see the guy that just, I mean, really, for his own sake, doesn't belong on the ice anymore. Right. He's just, he's not a productive member of the team, but he had a really good agent who signed him to a long, lucrative deal. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, that guy's, we're in the age of social media. That guy's family gets, I mean, I hate to say it, but death threats, that guy's family and him, Mm -hmm. they get insults and criticisms and that's just, it's unnecessary and it shouldn't be happening. Yeah. That is sad. Fans take that stuff too far. It's, it's, you know, I wouldn't want to be in that situation. It's odd, you know, you grow up, you grow up thinking, you know, maybe someday if you got really good, you could be a pro or something. And then when you get to be, you know, a grown up like us, you, you kind of see the downfalls of, 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 of fame. And, and, you know, maybe you feel like you dodged a bullet. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. So being, uh, being in the spotlight is definitely not what it's cracked up to be. Yeah. Well, well, the, and, well, what are we talking about? We're trying to get a podcast going. <laughs> We're trying to be famous. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, I suppose but, we are. But, but I think I think it's it's just our little our little group of of, of state of hockey. Yeah, we, we 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 like all your people that listen to us. We do. So thank you for doing that. So that's an interesting idea, though, and and I guess I would assume the only way to get that done would be to offer significant success concession on how much. Hockey-related revenue will go to the player share. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's some negotiating aspects that have to um, take place, but from an overall fan's perspective, and those are the people as a commissioner you're supposed to be making happy. Um, I mean, within reason, negotiating for that is definitely would be first on my priority list as commissioner. So um, to, 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 to get to expand the use of buyouts. Yes. I, w- I do want to point out, though, um, Sean McIndoe at Grantland had a piece this summer calling it the summer of financial sanity. I mean, there really weren't any major deals that are going to look like poison pills, as, as there were in you know a couple summers previous. You know, James, no, we I think, really, really exercised some discipline this summer. I mean, the only deal that I can really see is the Phil Kessel deal. Mm-hmm. Because I, I really think that's going to be a bust for Pittsburgh. Yeah. But they won the Colin sweepstakes, and that makes me sad. Yeah, well, <laughs> a lot of things about that make me sad. But if we, if we could buy out more players, they certainly could have, you know, spent that money on Colin. Yes. So I think that's the that's the point here. So um, um we're just kind of uh, waiting for uh, we we do have a guest scheduled, so hopefully he'll he'll join us shortly. So uh, and uh, yeah, so. Uh, um, so we're just going to keep kind of talking about things we would change. Maybe I'll do one. So um, we've kind of had this talk in the past, but uh, I would def about uh, shootouts versus tie games. But it, it, assuming that I'm losing the team tie argument, I would instantly tomorrow change this, change the way the standings are counted and expand every game to being three points for a regulation win. I could buy into that. I just think it makes more sense and it, it creates less dead hockey at the end of the third period and it keeps teams in, and I know the argument is that teams are in playoff races longer because overtime games inflate all the records but I mean I think, yeah, I'm ducks. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I think I think having three point games also still keeps teams in the races longer they just have to get results in the first 60 minutes to make up the ground and I think that that provides a good incentive yeah, I agree. That makes for better hockey. So, I mean, I, I, I mean, obviously, if I could do anything I wanted, I'm 100% on team tie game. But uh, I think that argument's been lost. Yeah. Um, it's, there's no tie in sports. It, it just it doesn't work. There's tie in the biggest sport in the world. The NFL? No, well, yeah, that too, but no, uh, soccer. Yeah, well, we're in America, okay? The world, the world doesn't matter. We're, we're... <laughs> this, is, this is America, and, and and we like Canada too. 
Yes, well, because we like hockey. <laughs> so uh, joining us here on the State of the State of Hockey podcast, uh, this is Jeff Ponder. He's a uh, longtime uh, blogger and St. Louis uh, Blues media member. Uh, he uh, right now is writing mostly for the hockey writers, and uh, and I know he's a Blues fan, but I, th- I think he's got a lot of thoughts on the league in general that will fit in with, uh, with the theme of our show tonight. So, uh, Jeff, welcome to the show. Hey guys, thanks for having me on. Oh, you sound great too, by the way. So awesome. Well, you know that's what everybody always tells me. So I mean, <laughs> so the uh, <laughs> biggest reason I wanted to have you on. I mean, I know I've been following your writing and stuff for a while, but um, you, you had a piece uh, earlier in August about hybrid icing, and so yeah, we're, we're just getting into rule changes here, and um, and won't we'll talk about things we would change in the league. Um, so uh, tell us, uh, what, what kind of motivated you to write this piece, and what are your thoughts on, on icing in general? Well, it's really funny because, um, as you said, I was uh, reporting for the St. Louis Blues this past season, which, by the way, I got the uh, pleasure of watching the playoffs in person. So let me tell you, that was uh, <laughs> a lot of fun for people here in St. Louis. But uh, I guess congratulations on that and ultimately having to play, play those much hated Chicago oh, Blackhawks. <laughs> well, I won't. Uh, I won't bring the uh, the decorum down here, though, by talking about that. So, uh, this actually stems back to uh, something that I actually started writing in February of this last year. I was sitting in the press box. I don't exactly remember which game it was, but I started uh, writing it because it was in the middle of play. The Blues had some great pressure. Uh, and uh, I think they were down by a goal or maybe up by a goal. I don't remember exact situation. And the other team uh, sent it down, and it was a situation like we've seen many times where it was one of those questionable calls where it could have gone either way. Um, and honestly, it, in my opinion, it should have been a uh, – well, they say the tie goes to the defenseman, but I felt like the forward for the other team actually had a, a step up on the defenseman. So – I uh, I instantly became angered, even though I, you know, obviously have to root for the hometown guys. I felt bad for the other team because I'm like, you know, they finally got a break. They could have easily turned that into offense, but instead they're going to be hemmed in their own zone again. And uh, I just it just made me say, you know, one, I miss standard icing. I was always a fan of it. I get why they got rid of it. But um, in a situation like that, you know, there's no question, you know, if this would have been a no touch icing, then they would have cleared the puck and they would have known exactly what was coming. There wouldn't have been that small glimmer of hope that their player would have gotten there first. So I started then and then I just kind of put it on the back burner because I had other things going on. And, and then it, uh, I, I rematerialized in August when I was talking to some people about hybrid icing. And I was like, oh, yeah, I think I, uh, I think I started writing a post about that a while ago. Maybe I'll finish that up. But <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's something that I'm just not a fan of. I and mean, there's multiple things we get into that I'm not a fan of in, in terms of NHL rules. But uh, yeah, it's definitely number one in my book. So um, and I'll tell you where I'm coming from. I have actually never been a fan of touch icing. I, I, I'm just not a fan of a, awarding a team a chance to negate a call that failed to reach the center line in the first place. I think if you can't do that, you know, and, and, and the other point you made here, that's been another reason is that in that it it's shaves a couple seconds off of every call when you don't have to wait for a touch or for the hybrid decision, you know, so, so the puck goes back into the attacking zone of the team that didn't offend and, and the play gets started that much quicker. Yeah. And on the uh, situation I just referenced, let's just say they're playing the wild in this game. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, it's uh the wild clear the puck out. And as I said earlier, they know when they do that, Hey, we're probably going to get nicing here. And yeah, it, it gives the blues who have been hemming that team in their zone for as long as they have been, it allows them to continue to do that for even longer. So if you've got 30 seconds left on the clock, if you have hybrid icing, there's a good chance that, you know, in that time you've lost six, seven seconds while the defenseman skates down. Whereas with no touch, it's immediate, you know, they clear it. And how long does it take the puck, depending on how they shoot it? Uh, how long does it take for it to get all the way down? You're talking maybe three, four mm-hmm. seconds. So, yeah, I mean, we've I mentioned it in the article I wrote, but as a hockey player, someone who's played the game my whole life and who's studied the game as, as closely as I have, and I'm sure you guys 
having a Minnesota Wild podcast, you you know, oh, yeah. it, it, any too. second we're... can can mean anything. I mean, we've seen right. multiple times buzzer beating goals, and when you're playing on the rink, three seconds can either feel like the the quickest time, depending on the situation you're in, or it could be an eternity. And I think that uh, you know having that extra seconds here and there could really help offense, which, you know, we all know is something the NHL has been wanting more of. They want more goals, so why not give them more opportunity to score? Um, my co-host Joe here uh, has the opposite opinion of icing than me, so um, I, I, I think he's pretty comfortable with the hybrid. Joe, what what, what are you thinking on, on this? Uh, I like the hybrid because it, it is best of both worlds. Um, it is the, the best for player safety, and... I think what you're alluding to is more of a problem with the referees than the actual call itself. Um, your, your argument, uh, against time obviously is something to take into account. Um, and that may be something that has to be revisited as in maybe add the seconds from the time the puck left the stick. Oh, that's, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's good. Yeah. Back in, you know, for being commissioner for a day, but, uh, <laughs> hybrid icing, is is still or it still is part of the game because it it adds that that hustle element. Yeah, and I'll agree with that. And and like I said, that's uh, kind of going against what Justin said. I actually have been a fan of uh, of standard icing in the day. And and again, I'm not going to argue that that should come back. I completely understand why the league got rid of it. If they can get rid of any injuries, even just one a season, they're going to do it, mm-hmm. and it's understandable. But yeah, I mean, uh, hey, actually, your idea of just adding seconds back on the clock, that's not a bad idea. And you got to figure that the argument for that is, well, you know, the referees are going to have to stop play longer and they're going to have to figure out exactly what the timing is there. But well, I think you make it a standard it, five seconds. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Dick I'd be fine with something like that. Dick Trax can, you know, install the buttons on all the scoreboards. I'm sure the NHL's got the coin for that. For, for the quick add three seconds. So that button would save a lot of time, actually, you know, because when they screw up penalties and whatnot, I mean, that's a long delay. Yeah, we've seen it happen a lot <laughs> where, you know, you see it in football more, but you definitely see yeah. it in hockey when the referee, you know, wants more time back on the clock and it takes a while. Yeah, if there was just a standard just add five seconds to the play kind of thing, then, I mean, really, that's, again, that would be a punishment for the team that iced it anyway because there's a chance that, from the time it left the stick, you're talking maybe two, three seconds if they slap shot it out. But if you're uh, just adding five seconds, no matter what, that really teaches them not to ice it. <laughs> yeah. it's not a, that's not a bad call. I like that. I never thought about that before. Yeah, that, that, that is a unique uh, idea, Joe. I've never understood the uh, hybrid icing saving the injury argument, though, because it only takes away, it only blows dead the most obvious plays. I mean, I guess it's because you're not going to the end board. But there's still potential for collision if the play's close. If it's not close, it's either going to be blown or waved right away. Okay, Justin, I have this question for you. How many players have gotten injured running for icing since uh, hybrid icing was in- introduced? I guess I don't know the answer to that. The answer <laughs> is actually zero. You're going to tell me, Joe. Yep. <laughs> it's zero. Okay. Yep. That's yeah, why. And- the the other argument that I have against hybrid icing is, and, and you know, I know that people will like to complain, which I'm one of them, about the excuse that we always hear. I mean, I live in St. Louis. I lived in Dallas for a short period, which I know you guys all love uh, mm-hmm. Dallas people. Um, Norm Green but, sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, their argument is always, well, hockey's so confusing. There's so many rules. And I'm not saying we need to appease those people because that's always just an easy argument to go to. But... To me, and obviously we all understand hybrid icing, but if someone's watching a game, and I can't tell you how many people when I lived in Dallas had no idea what happened when the whistle would blow. I'd, I'd be at games and I'd hear someone say, <laughs> well, why'd they blow the whistle? Well, what happened there? Well, it was icing. Well, nobody touched the puck. Like It's just another one of those rules to me that if you can avoid any confusion for newer fans, then get rid of it. And uh, I don't know, maybe you guys feel different. Well, that's on the announcers, I think. Uh my well, my perfect example of that is I didn't understand the game of baseball very well, um, but uh, I don't know if you ever watched the Twins, but Dick Bramer <laughs> and Burt Blylevin do the Twins broadcast here, and uh, no matter what happened during the game, they always had an explanation of what it was, why it was that way, 
And uh, I, I think that the rule explanation is, is much more on the announcers. Well, this kind of reminds me of the uh, um, NHL rules experiment ESPN was doing in the mid-90s when they really started oh, yeah. ramp. Yeah, yeah, you remember that? <laughs> yes, I do. So, so they would designate special telecasts that were going to have extra graphics and explanations to try and appeal to the newer fans. And I don't think, I mean, I, th- I think a quick, uh, a quick explanation of what is what and why it's that way. Mm-hmm. You know, but, first first person that makes it to the middle of the circle. Yeah. I don't actually think hockey is that complicated a game. I think the problem is the number of subjective calls there are. Yes. Yeah, and that's a hockey game. And this officiating is the like biggest issue one, in hockey. I think is my yep. point and Jeff's point. Yeah, that's, that's something I brought up in the article I wrote, too, is that uh, the problem is that we're leaving too much for the officials to decide. And that's that's my issue. If you can eliminate some of those, I mean, I'm one of those people that, you know, that people, you know, I know people like to, to rag on figure skating, but that's the reason that I don't like figure skating is because I don't like the, well, it's, it's a judge. Any type of judgment mm-hmm. in sports, I'm against. And I feel like that those that's just one of those judgment calls that's easily getting rid of if you do. And obviously there's still going to be judgment calls and icing. Did he cross the red line? Right. Did he go over the red line? That's still going to be a judgment no matter what in any form of icing. But, but this is another one that officials have to watch for as well as, is there too many men on the ice and, and uh, offsides for, for linesmen in particular. And, you know, it just feels like that's something that could easily be taken out of the game. And, and uh, something for them not to watch for, and that way they could be calling other plays uh, a lot easier. Yeah, and I'll tell well, you, um, as an as an ex official, I mean, the line calls are definitely much easier than deciding on penalties and whatnot. Well, and that that kind of brings me to my my next, uh, if I were commissioner for a day argument. Um, I think officials are giving way too much leeway. I think it takes two or three seconds for a puck to travel all the way down the ice and get iced, and for an official not to be able to set up and get a good view of that and see who makes it there first is absolutely unacceptable. And I think that officials that miss calls on a regular basis should be publicly fined. I 100% agree with that. I've, I've always said that. If they're going to make player fines and suspensions public, then all league employees should also be subject to that. I agree, yeah. Yeah, that, that's such a tough spot, though, for me. I, that's it's a go cool, though. And and but to to go down the public fine, but I want to bring it back to the icing. Actually, um, one of the problems I've noticed with the hybrid icing is, you know, the pucks that go around the boards, and you got two defensemen going side by side. You know, say say you got the uh, um, defenseman and the attacker, and, and suddenly the puck, you know, takes its left around the board. Um, suddenly the defender is closer than the attacker. Does that change? No, absolutely. How that's the the current rule is whoever is to the red line first, no matter what. Okay. Or I'm sorry, not to the red line, to the center of the circles. Center of the circles, yeah. Regardless of the position of the puck. So, like, if somebody's coming in facing the left side of the goal, puck's going the right side, you know, defender has is not on the right side, but as long as he gets the center hat to to the hash marks first, it should. Right, actually, Zucker Zucker made that happen last year. Um, Puck rolled around the boards, and he was coming in on the right so, wing. And, and maybe, Puck rolled all the way around to the left wing, and he just kept straight in, skating forward and beat out an icing. And maybe that is on the officials more, too, you know, um, because I, I don't feel like it's being called consistently in the slightest. I mean, I'd hate to go back through my, my live game tweets and see how many icing calls I thought were blown last year. Yeah, that's always fun. I know that uh, a lot of us have talked about that in, in the press box last year was – uh, you know, how many times this game alone have we questioned icing calls? And it's I, it, it's something, again, that I just feel like if you can get rid of a judgment call, then do it. Because And I'm not trying to, you know, give the referee or linesman a leeway and say, well, they're probably going to get it wrong, so let's just give them benefit of the doubt. I'm not even saying that. I'm just saying there's... Anytime you have a judgment call, they're not going to get it right 100% of the time. Justin, you said you're a former I, I, uh, official. I a couple years as a, as a level one little kid ref. So. Yeah, but, and I've, I have been too. And it's it's not easy. I mean, even a little kid's oh, game, there's so much to watch that you're going to miss stuff. And it's going to happen. And these people are human. They're not robots. But at the same time, I mean, depending on the angle of where they're mm-hmm. at, and all other things considered, the you know body position of the players, so many factors go into it, and it has to be a split-second decision. It's not like something that you can right. go back and review. 
And, oh, you know, help us if that if, happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not something you can go back and review right now. So, you know, it's like if this has to be a split second decision, let's get rid of all the judgments if we can. Actually, the, the, if you don't mind moving off this topic, um, what do you think about offside being reviewable next year? <sighs> That's a tough one. Um, I, I will say that if you would ask me this question one year ago today, I would have said, no, no, no on the coach's challenge. No way. This is, let's not slow the game down anymore. I've come around on it a little bit. Um, we all, I don't know if you guys remember the, the Matt Duchesne goal when he was 20 miles offside. And uh, I don't know if you guys saw that oh, one. It's, I remember uh, that. Yeah, that was horrendous. And that's something, again, you don't see that all the time, but. I mean, if you can eliminate that kind of stuff, then yes. But the cost of skin too. Yeah. Well, being the yeah, um, very among, fast game. Among many other things, that game. Oh, yeah. the Wilds were the better team in six of the seven games in that series. That's my favorite thing to say. Two years well, ago, we're not over that, Jeff. Can you believe it? That would day, man. I, <laughs> you're talking to a Blues guy here. We can't seem to get past the first round ever. Oh, so God. I know what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. So I mean and, and I'll agree with you. I mean I was definitely in in, in in the heck no camp a year ago. I don't mind the challenge for interference bringing bringing that notion into it. Be just get a second look at at who really hit who. You know, slowing it down instead of having to make that split second decision. Right. I hate this idea on offside. I think, you know, if the calls are so close and I, I don't mind that the attacking team gets one that's close once in a while. Now, obviously, the Duchesne situation was just poor. Yes. So those See, should only happen once in a blue moon. And I'm in the camp where you let the refs do what the refs do. You let them make their judgments. And if there's too many blatantly incorrect calls, you publicly find them. And after a while, you get rid of them. You get someone in there who can actually do the job. Yeah, I agree. And, and I agree with the offside that uh, I don't think that should be reviewable. I think bringing in the coach's challenge is fine in certain plays, but that, uh, that's just one that it's so nitpicky and it so rarely leads to right. a scoring chance. Like I, I can tell you for a fact, whenever there's a questionable uh, non-offsides call, I keep it a mental note and I say, hey, watch and see if this leads to a goal. 99 times out of 100, it doesn't. Um, the Duchesne one again was just and it's kind of a blasphemous, problem. and you're never, like you two never, and a half it's, feet off sides. yeah, you're never gonna see that. It happens at most once a season. That was two years ago, and I don't even, I can't think of one that happened last year that was that blatant. Here's, here's the other thing that I see that's problematic is, you know, what if somebody, you know, what if the team gains the zone and they score a goal 40 seconds later? Are they gonna roll all 40 seconds back over a couple inches the line's been missed? In addition no, to I, I, I agree. I don't like that rule. I, I think as soon as that that uh, happens a couple times, it's, it's going to bring that back into question. I hope. Yeah, I mean, we saw was it uh, the the shootout this year, right? There was something with the oh, the paving the ice before overtime. Mm -hmm. They uh, they oh, made that yeah, the rule change. Yeah, and then it yeah. it went on for what maybe three weeks, and yeah. they were like, yeah, let's this change this. Yeah. So there's a good chance that we could see something like that happen here pretty early on. <laughs> So, well, yeah, and that's, that's when, uh, what were the two teams? I know Florida was involved in it, but they went to like 21 rounds. Yeah. <laughs> in that was shootout. crazy. Yeah. Can't have that. <laughs> so, uh, Jeff, I'll, I'll ask you this question. If you were commissioner for a day, what is the first change you would make aside from anything already mentioned? Well, um, I got two. Okay. And uh, I guess I'll start with, uh, I don't know how you guys feel about the trapezoid. I would do away with the trapezoid. I am, uh, listen, I'm not a fan. I mean, as a, as a defenseman, I still play. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so, um, yeah, I, 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 I actually don't hate it as much as most fans do because I saw where, it, when, when it first came in, I really saw where it brought the emphasis on forechecking back. You know, but see, I like anything that adds hustle to the game. So, oh, we may have lost Jeff. We're gonna try and get us back. So he should probably explain trapezoid. Yes. Well, the trapezoid. 
Well, I'll, I'll just keep going while we're recording. Yeah, so, I mean, th- you know, the area behind the goal, um, where the, the only the goaltender is allowed to play it if the puck's behind the goal line. Um, they can't go into the corners anymore. Oh, oh I, I think I'm back. Yes, you're back. So we just kind of gave a little more background on what the trapezoid is. So, and, uh, yeah, so I guess we left off, uh, I don't hate it so much. I could go either way on that, but, uh, you're, you're saying as a defenseman. Yeah, I mean, I just, I don't like my goalie playing the puck, but I, I believe it's his right. And a lot of teams, you know, towards, uh, you know, with Marty Turco, the Dallas Stars teams, and, they started designing plays for when their goalie plays the puck. So I don't think it's a problem. I think that it was a lot of forwards complaining that they don't get a chance to get to the puck. I I don't know. I, I've never understood the need for it. I think that, you know, if, if you're a good enough player and a smart enough player, and, and I'll say, here's the thing that I'll say against it. The reason that I'm for the trapezoid is because anytime you touch a goalie, you get an injury. I'm not an injury, a penalty, I'm sorry. Right. And and that is more annoying than anything because they call it goalie interference when he's playing the puck three feet from his net. That needs to be changed. So change that rule to where if a goalie comes out, I'm not saying you need to come in and hammer the goalie, but you know you have every right to come in, lift his stick, and take mm-hmm. the puck from him just like he's a defenseman. Change that rule, and then at the same time, get rid of the trapezoid, let the goalies do it if they choose to. Okay. No, so he, I'm 100% in favor of anything that adds hustle to the game. Um, I do agree with you, though, and even as a former goaltender, if you play the puck, you're a player at that point, and you deserve to be treated as a player. And if that means that you need to be checked off the puck, hey, so be it. If you don't like it, stay in your crease. <laughs> I wouldn't mind if they gave the goalie a little crease back in exchange for that. Yeah, and, and I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying, like, you need to have the, the Milan Lucic, Ryan Miller situation. I mean, right. if it needs to just no. be, like, you know, you're allowed to come in and bump them. You can, mm-hmm. you know, kind of smother them into the boards a little bit if they're close to the boards, you know, but you can't board them, you can't high stick them, you can't cross check them, but just, no, but they're just like any other player. No, a legal check. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that, that would be an interesting change. I, I, I Yeah. Yeah, I, I think... But I, if they're in their crease... That's a completely different story. Right, and and I would Agreed, and I yeah. would I'm and I would probably hope they get a little crease back because they did shave it at the end of the nineties. There, those little ends, you know. Yep. Besides, I guess I'm a little biased though because I uh, I hated going out and playing the puck as a goaltender. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, felt I, like I, all all it took was one little mistake. Right. I hated. I and that's one of the reasons why I, I wasn't a big fan of Hasek. Yeah, me neither. Oh, that I, drove me nuts. I love I love Dominic Hasek. I uh, I play with a guy ever. still to this day that uh, he's been playing 15 years in goal and he will not play the puck. Uh, no, and one time I I, I I finally talked to him and we had like a six nothing lead. I'm like, next time the puck comes to you, you're gonna play it. I want you to play it. Just try. He it came time. out, tried to clear it out, put it right on a guy's tape. He shot it into the empty oh, net. Oh no! <laughs> so so I skated back out to him. I go, you know what? Don't worry about playing the puck anymore. <laughs> yeah, we had that last night. One of our goalies played the puck, and that's what happened. Yep, that'll those, happen. those never come to be when I when, when I play wake. I don't, I don't know. Oh well, <laughs> maybe I got to get faster. <laughs> that's that's the key. Jeff, what's the second one on your mind? Well, this one is stupid. So go ahead <laughs> okay. and get ready to make fun of me. <laughs> it's summer. Stupid, stupid plays. <laughs> there you go. Um, I. I don't know if you guys have talked about this ever, but I would love to change the jerseys back. Really? White is home, dark is away. And my reasoning, and it sounds silly, is because when I go to a game, I am seeing the exact same colors every single night, 41 games a season. So I'm seeing blue on white every single game. I'm ready to see white on black, white on red, white on green, like, I, that was, and it sounds dumb, but but aesthetically, you just get a different look every time you go to the game if you have the uh, away team wearing a different jersey, and and that to me is was part of the fun when I was a kid. I used to love going and seeing the different designs of the away team's jerseys. You know, I mean, it was before you could just look up anything on the internet. I'm dating myself here, <laughs> but uh, you know, I mean, I used to love you know being like five, six years old and going and seeing a, as much as I hated them, the Red Wings jerseys and, 
you know, even the the old Minnesota North Stars mm-hmm. jerseys, you know, now you go to a game and it's the same blue jersey versus a white a team wearing a white jersey with a different logo. All, all our opponents are the same. Like, we might as well dress them all the same. To, to that's why we have Jerry alternate Seinfeld. jerseys. What? Oh, that's why you have home alternate jerseys, Joe. Is that what yeah. you said? Yeah. I don't know. I like the I like the solid colors for home. I I think yeah. I do too on balance, but uh oh, may have lost Jeff again. Oh, Jeff, the internet gremlins are getting you. He's coming back. I was just gonna say, yeah, I think I'm on on team colors at home too. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm definitely a fan of that. And uh, but I mean, I think it's the uh, NCHC uh, this year is gonna switch like halfway through the year. Maybe that's you know happy medium at the All Star break. You, you you do it the other way. I, I think the HL did that for a while too. Actually, Jeff, did we get you back? Oh, they're still trying. Ah, drat. Well, hopefully we, we get Jeff back. But if we don't, Wait, I guess we'll go off the show. I mean, well, really, I, I actually, if you want to go that route, I think it should be goalie's prerogative. Goalie's prerogative? I mean, in baseball, the pitcher chooses the uniform. I did not know that. So, Jeff, did we get you back? Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on over here. <laughs> so, Joe and I just kind of went on. We're both on team colors, we think, for home. But uh, okay. Joe just brought up an interesting idea, baseball related. Joe, say it again. Goalie's prerogative. Ooh, goalies get to decide. So the home goalie gets to pick. I like it. I'm all for it. That's a cool idea. I kind of went on to talk about. I think the AHL did this, and I think they're uh, the NCHC is doing it this year, where they're going to switch halfway through the year. Okay, that's not a bad idea either. Yeah, so I, I think that's good too, but. Well, and it's nice too, and, and and to go four with the current way is all teams now have third jerseys. Right. So you know you'll get to see your team's third jersey here and there, and and that's cool. So yeah, I mean having a a goalie prerogative or switching halfway through that gives you the option to still play with your third jersey at home. Yeah, I mean the I like Wild it. when they introduced their new uh, road jerseys, they had I think four games where they uh, played with the road jerseys at home. That was kind of cool. That's cool. Yeah, I like that. Okay. Well, that's a good idea. So, well, uh, 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 Jeff, before we uh, let you go, I, I got to ask you one question that Joe and I uh, do constantly disagree about. Are you on team tie game or team shootout? I am on team tie game. Yeah! What guy in the world <laughs> agrees with me? <laughs> what kind of competitors are you? <laughs> I just not feel like a if, competitive spirit. If you have... Two teams for... play their hearts out all game. Why does it come down to a skills competition to decide who wins it? Because that's part of the game. And you know what? You can play your heart out all you want. It's only been part of the I game play my heart out every day, years. but guess what? I'm still not you know, extremely successful. It, it is what it is. It's a competition. There has to be a winner. There has to be a loser. But what if two teams score the same number of goals? You have to artificially create goals to decide one team sucks. Well, no, I'm in, if you really want my honest opinion, I'm in favor of continuous OT, but that's just me. Me too. Yeah, that I'd be, and, and I will say that I'm probably going to be more okay with the shootout now than ever because I really think we're going to see a lot less shootouts. I agree with the three on three change. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I get your argument on the skills competition, but if you're going to change it, why get rid? Why say tie game? I, I don't agree with that part of what you're saying. If you if you want a winner and a loser, there there should be continuous OT. Well, then let me say then, it, if, given the options I was given, I would say oh, yes. tie game. But if I'm making my own rules, I would say four on four for four minutes, three on three for three minutes, and then a shootout. That's what I would go with, which I believe is that's how the AHL had it last year. Yes. Was it not? That's how it's going to be now. No, they're uh, just doing five minutes of three on three. That's it. Or and yeah, then a shootout. Five three on three. Oh, that's right. And yep. I just want to um, say for the record. I guess I if I were get... making rules, I would go five minutes of four on four and then uh, unlimited three on three. Yeah. yeah. I'd be winner. fine with that, that too. Work. That'd be great. I just want to say for the record the Minnesota State High School League has had eight minute overtime for as long as I can remember. I don't get what the NHLPA's beef is. Half of them probably played in the Minnesota High School League. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. That's crazy. Yeah, we um we have I think ten minutes of OT out here in the uh, really? uh Missouri uh, ice hockey league. Wow. 
Yeah. That surprised me. But that's good. Yep. So, there you go. But yeah, I, I mean, my idea would actually be you can do a scrape, you play 15 minutes of overtime. And so it'll kind of have the playoff feel, but after 15 minutes, if you must have a winner, then, then I guess I can I can deal with the shootout under those conditions if it you know doesn't become a quarter of the games in a season. Right. Because I remember in the North Stars days, there was years when the North Stars would tie 20 games a year. And <laughs> I can see where that's a little excessive. Yeah, and that's kind of how the shootouts become. Mm-hmm. The shootouts become a way to really decide games more than ever, and and I think that's why I'm so happy with this rule change. Well, I, I I'll be even happier when they go to three points of regulation win for sure. I'd be fine with no points uh, to the or loser the other way. in <laughs> overtime or shootout. So all losses are one are zero and one if you don't get it in sixty minutes. Yep, I'd be fine with That's that. That's the other way to do it. <laughs> so. Yep. Interesting. Well, good stuff. So, uh, thank you for uh, for uh, joining us tonight, Jeff. I'm sorry you had some connection problems. But, uh, oh, it's all right. That's otherwise, you uh, sound very fabulous. Strange. So, I guess uh, my Skype just doesn't like you guys. Oh, let's see. <laughs> when you're connected, you're clear. That's awesome. That's so. awesome. Very cool. It was nice talking to you guys, and uh, thanks for having me on. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Uh, that's thank Jeff you. Ponder. You can follow yes. him on Twitter at jponder94. And uh, from uh, thehockeywriters.com, and I will link the icing page uh, story on the uh, on the show page. And uh, if you didn't, haven't seen me tweet it many times when it first came out, so so just an interesting guy. Yes, not bad, not bad for a Blues fan. No, not bad, not bad at all. And I he didn't this... even uh, he didn't even beat us up all that bad either. So. I mean, and I don't know, and uh, I've been trying to. We, we've been talking about getting him on all weekend, and um, it's kind of forced me to have this thought. I think the Blues, at least in my opinion, might be the most likable team in the Central Division. You know, outside of Minnesota, of course. And they uh, employ Steve Ott. I, I don't agree with that. Yeah. Um I might get take some flack for this, but uh, as much as I hate the Blackhawks, uh, they are the most respectable team. They play the cleanest game. They are a team based on skill. They play that. the game the right way. I'll give you that. And I have to respect that. I think I can give you that. So, But I can very easily come up with reasons I hate Nashville and Winnipeg and Colorado and Dallas. That's true. Okay, so more, we'll more than St. Louis Minnesota Chicago. Wild, Chicago Blackhawks, St. Right. Louis Blues. Right. But that's so odd because, you know, the whole point in being in the Central Division again was, you know, because... The North Stars hated the Blues and hated the Hawks, and it's I just don't feel that same hatred. No, we got it with the Avalanche and the Jets, I think, are our biggest. Yeah. The, the Avs are definitely number one rivalry right now. Okay. I, I think that has more to do with Patrick Waugh. <laughs> oh, I agree. I can't believe he still has this job. If I were commissioner, I would force the, the Avalanche to fire Patrick Waugh. Oh, come on. Entertainment value alone is worth it. All right. I stand down. So <laughs> we covered a, a lot of changes that we would talk about. Jeff really brought up a lot of the things I was I was thinking about. So the standings are the big one for me. Uh, we talked a little bit about discipline, too. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll just bring up, I don't think the NHL is hard enough on divers. No, I agree with you. And, and um, I don't think it's a bit as big an epidemic as it is in other sports, but uh, it definitely, I mean, the embellishment calls, again, is a, that mm-hmm. thing that Jeff likes to bring up. It, it's a subjective thing. Mm-hmm. And, and and I think if I were commissioner, I would take any diving obligation away from the referee to make that call. I don't. Think I agree, I, yep, like I, the NBA does it, just I, fine them. Yeah, I think that, yeah, fines and suspensions escalate. I think that is just so much better handled you know, with a second look than in a split second. I mean, if it's obvious, you can leave the rule in there, but I don't think emphasizing that that's the referee's main job is good. I think it's better for the referees if they know the deterrence is over their head. And I think in the long run, that will reduce diving and let them focus on the calls they need to be making. Yeah, and one thing that to bring up discipline, the NHLPA... That's the biggest joke in the history of sports. The, the, That's the, literally worse than the replacement refs. The, the fact that they stick up for, for players no, they shouldn't be sticking up. The fact that they don't do anything, really. Nothing productive. They're not in charge of player safety. They're in charge of player sa- favoritism. Right. I agree with you there. I, th- I think that they, they stick up for 
you know, way too many bad causes. I mean, Ryan Suter, who did he slash Oshi? Mm-hmm. He slashed Oshi, got two game suspension for it. You could see in the play that he stopped doing what he was doing when he did it and apologized to Oshi. Mm-hmm. Like, there was no intent there. It was completely accidental. And they suspended him for two games. Oh, the one that Yet, really... Matt Martin takes a run at Ballard Ugh. and gets nothing for it. Only because of some arbitrary seven-tenths of a second standard that nobody knew about before. Yeah, it's... Shit. The one that really set me off the wrong foot with Brendan Shanahan was Pierre-Marc Bouchard and Matt Calvert. At the start yeah. of the third period of, of that opening night, I was at that game, Matt Calvert lifted Bouchard's stick and it hit him in the face. He totally did it to himself. Bouchard got two games. Stupid Matt Calvert. <laughs> Sorry, that that reminds me of uh, Koivu lifting Parisi's stick and or Koivu hitting Parisi in the mouth, and I just oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, you give him stitches. That was oh man, that was bad. so. So there's gonna be real life hockey in about a week. Yes. I'm going to a couple of preseason games, and I'm very excited. I'm actually excited for preseason. <laughs> well, that's good. Well, before we move on there, I mean, are, are there any more if Joe were commissioner for a day? Um, I think the the only other one I had would be, uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, I love the expansion of the NHL, but uh, there, there are certain cities that deserve teams more than others. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking uh, your team should have a medium, a median attendance of 40% of its capacity per game. Um, and that's actually pretty fair and uh, reasonable. I don't know of any teams that are actually that low. Uh, I think the Panthers were on that threshold last year. Yeah, that's true. They were probably, they, they did have some crowds. Of like and I'm not talking about sales. I'm talking about attendance. Right. So if your building is appearing two-thirds empty, then, it, you know, Arizona's the same way. Right. I'm I'm not talking about sales because you can corporations can buy all the tickets they want. I want fans in the seats to make it look good on TV. Yeah. There should be actual fans, you know, people who come to the game. Mm-hmm. Not people who are like, Oh, I got season tickets. <laughs> but I'm not gonna show up. <laughs> right. But I never go to any games. Boy, that's so silly. Why would you well I'm I guess Corporations we, do it all the time. I know yeah. a bunch of them. I, I guess we got money to burn. What the heck, eh? <laughs> well, it's a tax run off. Yeah. But my point is, there's that. that's a team that could be in another market that would be much more appreciated, and I think that as a commissioner, I think it would be my responsibility to facilitate that change. And, and opposite of what this commissioner does, and that is defending all the relocation uh, decisions to a fault, which yeah, is what exactly. he appears to be doing in Arizona. Yeah, well, Arizona is going to be not Arizona much longer. We'll see. I think they. I, I. I hope they have an eye on Seattle, and that might be why Seattle didn't, you know, complete the the first stage of the bidding process. And, uh, hey, Washington State is. The most beautiful state, I think, in the contiguous 48. I've never been. I have friends out of there, and they say the same thing. And uh, I'm telling you, the only thing that stopped me from moving there so far is the fact that they haven't had a hockey team. <laughs> it might it might be all over. <laughs> if they get a hockey team, I might be out of here. Okay. I'll miss you, Joe. <laughs> but no, but you can start your own Seattle's podcast. such a beautiful city. For, for, for the, for the uh, Seattle Pilots or whatever they end up being. I think that was a team once upon a time. Oh, I don't know. That would be cool. We could we could talk all day about team names yeah. for Seattle. So, yeah, yeah, I, I, I definitely think two teams are coming, and it's definitely looking like Las Vegas and Quebec City have the inside track. Yeah, no, that's kind of bothering me. About Las Vegas, or both, or either. No, that it's not Seattle. Yeah, I guess they couldn't get get you know uh, everybody on the same page for. For a bid, there's a few competing arena proposals, and none of them were advanced. Yeah. The problem. So, but maybe, or maybe they're being smart. I mean, maybe you know they don't have to pay half a billion for an expansion team when they know 
you know, there's a decent chance Florida or Arizona might be on the move. Yeah, and actually, I think uh, is it Carolina too. Yeah, uh, that, cause, yeah. Who knows what's going to happen? I know Rutherford's actively selling because he wants to retire. So, and that's yeah. They're probably third on the list, which is a shame because you know I know they were a really well attended team ten years ago. Yeah, they were. I mean, that Ginla kind of sparked that. Yeah. Oh, wow. Or, I'm sorry, not a Ginla. No. Um, who, who am I thinking? I can't even tell you. Uh, won a Stanley Cup, too. Matt Cullen was on that team, I believe. Yes, Matt Cullen was on that yeah. team, but I'm thinking they had... I love Matt Cullen. Why can't they had... A, he's a Hall of Famer. Why can't I think of his name? Ugh. Oh, wow. Well. Someone will tweet it to us tomorrow, I'm sure. <laughs> So yeah, so yeah, so I guess we could still talk a little wild news, even though we did the commissioner for a day thing. So um, yeah, so uh, our season tickets came, which is awesome. They did. Uh, I know everyone was all super excited about the packaging, but I was kind of disappointed actually. Well, you you weren't into the free flag. I mean, I like the free flag, but I mean that's it. Oh, I thought that's something. It went right on my cue ball. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I my, my problems with the Minnesota Wild season ticket holders is vast, and it uh, involves a lot of things. I personally favor the uh, printed tickets. I like to keep a ticket book. Yeah. Shoot, I have every ticket stub since, like, 1998 in a drawer. I mean, I have all my ticket stubs, too, but they're the printed ones. Right. They come on a little printer when you scan in. Right. I mean, I like I like that. Um, the giveaways have been a season ticket holder pin and now a generic wild flag that you can't get the tape off of. That, that was my problem too. I suppose I could wash it. I yeah, but it's still it's tape. It's glue. I know. I, I just don't know if it's going to come off. So it's a little bummed. But I'm excited. This is my first year as a season ticket holder. Yeah, I mean, it's nice. It's, I, it's I an like 11 last gamer, year's I'm a little splitting better. four ways, but still. And Do you I, have four different cards? Yep. Oh, see, I only have the one. Yeah, I guess my rep said you can, you can ask for as many as you want. Oh, wow. So nice. you, you can talk to your rep about that. I don't know if it's too late or not. But yeah. No, I've, I've asked my rep for enough things. I have a friend at work that got diagnosed with some pretty severe stage four cancer, and it sounds like they're going to donate some stuff to auction off for him so mm. on the other side of that Minnesota Wild season ticket holder thing is they do do a lot of good for the community well that is that is good 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 to hear so I'm excited such sad news though yeah it is he's he's a guy that trained me so mm. um so uh, what games are you going to in the preseason uh I saw something Winnip about you and Aunt Di Murphy going I think it's, yeah, Winnipeg and St. Louis, I think I'm going to see. Nice. Um, first one is on a Sunday. I can't think of which. Uh, Maybe I can help you out here. In the actually, yeah, I can. It's the 27th of September. Okay. That one I'm going to with my kid. Okay. And then uh, that Thursday I'm going with Di Murphy. Nice. So you're not going to the first one next week, although that one might be. No, that's on the 21st. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, they're home to Buffalo on the 21st. And then, so you're going to the last two home to Winnipeg and home to, home to Buffalo. Correct, yes. Nice. And then it'll be on. October's almost here, folks. You've hung in there. We're going to probably do uh, at least one more show before we go back doing weekly shows, uh, which we'll, we'll start doing the, the week of this. Season starting, prob I'm, I'm thinking probably uh, after the uh, home opener against St. Louis, which I'm hoping to get tickets for, because that was not in our package, so we'll see what happens. I will be getting tickets to that as well. Sweet. You got the day I wanted, because I don't get paid until that day, but uh, I talked to my season ticket holder rep, and she's going to make an exception for me, so. Oh, nice. Well, good deal. So, <laughs> well, so, so, so it sounds like they're helpful. <laughs> Yeah, anyone who uh, wants to come out with us this year and watch yeah. a few games or 
maybe watch some away games at a Definitely. venue of a mutually agreed upon location. So, Let us know. Sounds good. We'll keep you informed of all that. Thank you for hanging with us this summer, and uh, we can't wait till the excitement comes back in the fall. So uh, I guess so. Uh, we'll just uh, end the show there. So uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, another good one. And uh, uh, so for uh, Joe Hayford, and you can follow him at Satsu Hockey Joe. I'm Justin Jelnick. You can follow me at Satsu Hockey JJ. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time. Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening to the State of the State of the Hockey podcast. The music was created and produced by Deeb. To hear more of his tracks, visit soundcloud.com slash Deeb.